Well, good afternoon. I'm Andrew Cohen, and I teach in the philosophy department, and I direct the Jean Baer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics here at Georgia State. Before we begin, I'd like to promote one event that the Blumenfeld Center for Ethics and the Department of Philosophy will be sponsoring tomorrow. Greg Pence, one of our speakers for today, will be speaking tomorrow in the philosophy department at 3 p.m. This talk will address the early Bucharest intervention study in the neurosciences, and this talk will be titled, Is a famous study in neurosciences like the most infamous study in American medical research? That's tomorrow, Friday, at 3 p.m. The philosophy department, that's 25 Park Place on the 16th floor. We are grateful today for the chance to foster conversation about continuing controversies in medical ethics. Technological developments in medical fields have continued to challenge our understandings of ourselves and what we owe to others. The challenges go back to the first baby born through in vitro fertilization and have continued to pace since then. Recent research in, in technology in fields such as stem cells and cloning raise crucial questions about what disease means, how to respond to disease, and what normalcy means. These technologies and research also suggest important questions about what it means to be human and what the proper reach of science is and what the proper scope of political authority ought to be in regulating science. Today we are honored to have with us two distinguished bioethicists who will help to shape our conversation and our understanding about such issues. Their remarks can help us to get a better sense of what we can expect of medical researchers and practitioners, what we owe to ourselves, to our neighbors, and to future generations. You can read more in detail about our two speakers. We're going to begin with Professor Greg Pence, who teaches philosophy at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He'll be followed by Dr. Paul Root Wolpe, who is professor of bioethics at Emory and directs the Ethics Center there. So our format will be as follows. Professor Pence will lead us off with about 12 to 15 minutes of remarks, followed by Professor Wolpe. And thereafter, they may offer some brief additional remarks on each other. And then we can open it up to general Q&A and discussion, and we'll wrap up by 5.15. So please join me in welcoming Professor Greg Pence. Thank you for coming out on this kind of gloomy day. Uh, I want to tell you some stories, and I think Mr. Wolfie's uh, remarks is going to, are going to kind of go together nicely, because uh, I'm going to kind of bring us up to date on what's happening with stem cells, and I think he may take it a little bit higher. Uh, and part of my view is kind of uh, personal. Uh, but, uh, I've been involved with bioethics for about 40 years. And 40 years ago, uh, when people were talking about IVF, in vitro fertilization, uh, I lived through, there was a lot of fears that people had. People imagined people pouring chemicals into a test tube and something like this coming out uh, as assisted reproduction. They call it, you know, test tube babies. So we've, we've had a remarkable amount of hysteria over assisted reproduction, which um, we finally got over. Now there's been, a, you know, five million babies have been created through assisted reproductive technology worldwide. But it's the tale I'm going to tell you is not an entirely happy tale. So let's go forward. Uh, one picture is worth a thousand words, and when, especially a color picture. Uh, when Louise Brown was born, uh, which did not really get any kind of approval in advance, the fact that she was a healthy baby basically made a lot of controversy go away. It's very important that the first uh, child be healthy and look like that. Uh, today, she's actually about she was born in 1978, she's much older, and has had a child by IVF herself, and she frequently says, how did I ever fit in a test tube? Because uh, she's a full-figured woman. Uh, so I think one of the problems uh, around stem cells is that in the early days, stem cells were associated with embryos. And uh, people always have strange views of what an embryo looks like. This is one of my favorite words in philosophy. Woody Allen also uses it. It was a homunculus, a small person. And people often think that an embryo is a small person. Aristotle actually thought this. He thought that uh, when sperm went to the uh, uh, uterus that uh, there was a small person. 
involved in this experiment. It just got bigger. But what do embryos actually look like? That is a eight-cell human embryo on the top of a big five-point pen. Uh, looks kind of like eight golf balls. Uh, some people think that uh, it's murder to use an IUD and have these not implant on the inner wall. Uh, and of course, it has the potential to be a person, which is very important morally. Uh, you can't talk about stem cells without talking about the pedigree and embryos. Human embryos are part of the pedigree of the ethics. Okay? So we have lived through something this week called the stem cell wars. Um, and I, I just want to kind of step back and say that if we had the technology today, I'm going to tell you about in a second that Yamanaka came up with, and we hadn't gone through a huge amount of controversy about embryos and cloning, we would probably be a lot ahead in terms of personalized medicine and regenerative medicine, but we're not ahead. And we did go through all that controversy, and in a way it helped bring about Yamanaka's discoveries. Uh, so we, stem cells are, are, are magical things. They're in our bodies, but they used to be hard to find. Uh, they're um, in bone, and some of them are more differentiated. And for, for a long time, it was just hard to get them or hard to use them in research. Okay. And then in 1998, uh, two people at different places um, created a way to basically make a stem cell into a little factory that kept repeating itself. This is called an immortalized stem cell line. And uh, even that was not the greatest thing because the University of Wisconsin um, charged too much at first. They got greedy. The Research Foundation got greedy. And instead of charging $50 a vial, they wanted like $5,000 or $50,000 a vial. And no one wanted to pay that. So that set everything back a long time. By the way, there's an excellent book uh, on stem cells by Alice Park, P-A-R-K. Um, she, if you go to the grocery store, Time Magazine has a story on her. Uh, she's got an article this week on uh, new drugs for Alzheimer's. She's an excellent writer, an excellent science reporter. Uh, so we didn't get... This took a little bit too long, to, okay? Uh, embryonic stem cells seem to be able to do things that another kind of stem cell can't do. Um, and they, they have the potential to be, be teased in any kind of cell we need, like brain cells, I need more brain cells, cardiac cells, could be very valuable, okay? But then uh, we discovered adult human stem cells, which do not come from embryos, <coughs> and um, hopefully figure out a way to make them an immortalized stem cell. And it seemed like for a while that if, you, if we did enough of adult stem cells, we really wouldn't need embryonic stem cells. And, and researchers kind of disagreed about that. And various presidential commissions discuss, you know, address like how much we should create specialized embryonic stem cell lines or use spare embryos. And, you know, Unfortunately, during the George W. Bush administration, with Leon Cass as chair of the Bioethics Commission, all this went basically nowhere. Uh, it was just basically paralyzed and stopped. Uh, President Bush at one point said we have 28 uh, embryonic stem cell lines kind of left over. We could use them. But most researchers said that, that was far from adequate. And they, they deteriorate over time. Okay? So, and, and the other thing we found is that some, for some conditions, Adult stem cells work better, they're already differentiated, and for others, embryonic stem cells. But the big war was over the moral status of the embryo. And because that wasn't ever solved, embryonic stem cell research really didn't get very far. Okay. Then an amazing person came along, Shinya Yamanaka, who was a little bit at, in San Francisco and back and forth to San Francisco. He basically figured out that how to use four genes to take a cell, like a skin cell, and tease it to go back into what's called this poor potent state. This is just an astonishing achievement. And he was kind of lucky, because he had like 5,555 tries, and on some of the, on the very first tries, he figured out the four genes and how to do it. Um, and basically bypassed the need for embryos, and also for human eggs. Uh, so 
basically, instead of the magic being in an embryonic stem cell, he basically taught us, and I don't think this has fully been appreciated, the magic is really in every cell you have. Every cell could be used to regenerate medicine for you. Um, and uh, that's a very strong source of uh, pluripotent stem cells, and it's basically become the go-to source for, for, for stem cells, I, so IPS cells. Um, and we have confirmed that basically, many times, that IPS cells can do the same thing as embryonic stem cells. So the, at first there were some questions about that, but now it looks like that's great, okay? And there's a whole bunch of proposals for what we should do uh, with humans. Uh, we, we've had uh, IPS cells injected in people with heart attacks, and various people with cancer want to try, uh, people with degenerative muscular uh, diseases like Michael Fox want to try. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not doing much. Next slide. Uh, partly because the big ethical issues haven't gone away. One more. Uh, and also, uh, there's some bad things going on. Uh, there's been so much hype about stem cells that, as you might expect, people are going on the internet making claims, and be desperate people are going to Mexico, going to India, Philippines, uh, paying lots of money, trying to get some kind of magical uh, stem cell cure. Uh, and the problem, and then Rick Perry uh, did something extraordinary in Texas. He gave the sim, the sim cell company an exemption from FDA approval. He did not have to go through any kind of trials. Rick Perry had back pain, and he got himself injected. And two weeks later, his back pain went away. But guess what? Half the people who have back pain, their back pain goes away in two weeks. Doesn't matter. You get any bananas, and it would go away, right? Doesn't necessarily mean that. The stem cell did anything. And FDA basically told him a year or two later, stop that. You know, we have to have real research and real uh, evidence before we can allow people to sell this stuff. Okay? But uh, USA Today uh, last summer reported that uh, Gordy Howe uh, and John Brody, who were star athletes in their younger days and are, have experienced very significant illnesses now, have both gone to uh, outside the country to get stem cell treatments and claim, their families claim, that there's a, they're having great success. There's really no long-term follow-up on these claims. It's very individualized, anecdotal, and that's really created a huge amount of claims and money, which is what I call the dark side of stem cell therapy. Okay? Well, one of the, I'm, I'm almost finished. Um, I went over recently and talked to a guy on the other side of my campus uh, and Tim Towns, who five years ago has had cured sickle cell in mice. And I said, Tim, where are we today? Well, where's the clinical trials? We have not done one clinical trial at all, even though the front page of the Washington Post and Wall Street Journal sickle cell cured in mice. Why is that? Well, a couple reasons. One, most people with sickle cell are African American. And we're in Alabama. We have the Tuskegee syphilis study. Everybody read about Henry O'Rourke. So we're going to be really careful not to kill anybody in the first you know, attempt at gene therapy. And we've had some slips of Jesse Gelsinger. Uh, but the other, it's actually there are African Americans in Birmingham who are at risk for sickle cell who want to try something. And they've seen it in their own families. But the problem is the NIH and OPRR and FDA won't allow any clinical trials. They want. They're actually doing something that Europe does with genetically modified food. Uh, they have kind of adopted the precautionary principle. They want us to prove in advance that there'll be no harm. That is a very difficult, almost impossible thing to prove. You know, you've got to take some risk. You know, the first time penicillin was given out, it's probably some people had allergic reactions, you know, and some people died. We're never going to cure sickle cell if we don't go forward some way. And unfortunately, it seems to me we have become a society that's really averse to risk. Uh, and it, it may just be too controversial for Birmingham, Alabama to be the first to do genetic therapy that's successful because of our racial history. But unfortunately, it's people with sickle cell who will suffer. One more. <coughs> the 
I think, that's my last slide, the discovery of stem cells and iPS cells is one of the most revolutionary discoveries in the history of medicine. And the US NIH is the big treasury. The fact that we can't do more with this is a tragedy. Um, our whole history up to this point, with you know, the controversies about embryos, controversies about cloning, led Yamanaka to kind of do a workaround to make this. But we're not going, getting anywhere now. We have this magic in a box and we can't pull it out. So I'm kind of frustrated with where we are right now. Uh, and if I had somebody with like a degenerative muscular disease, were basically, you know, they're telling you that you can use your own cells to create your own medicine. But we're too chicken to kind of, from my point of view, to, to like let people volunteer and do this. So I'm going to stop now and let my colleague, Professor Wolfman, take over. Well, thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to not talk about stem cells specifically just a little bit. I'm going to take us up to a much broader perspective looking at this entire uh, enterprise of biotechnological interve intervention in human beings and talk about why I think uh, there's so much resistance to some that I agree with everything that uh, Dr. Spence said. Uh, similar talk to that. Um, so that I hope that this will complement that really well. I'm a sociologist, uh, not a philosopher like Dr. Penn, so I am much more interested in my professional work in kind of the social, ideological, and cultural aspects of biotechnology. So last May, this past May, I brought uh, people from all over the world together here in Atlanta over to the Tabernacle, and we had an incredible conference called Beings, which stood for Biotechnology and the Ethical Imagination, a global summit. Uh, we had an incredible faculty, people like Steve Pinker and Margaret Atwood and many others uh, got up and we had this, and, and the people that I invited from all over the world, from over 25 countries, were both, were, were across every discipline, including arts and uh, humanities. I always include an arts component to everything that I do, so we had an art exhibit there as well. Um, and from all, the whole ideological spectrum, from um, the sort of transhumanists to the uh, people who are very resistant to uh, genetic technologies. And we are now writing a consensus paper that I hope will come out pretty soon in either science or nature. But the point is that it was really interesting to hear this debate. And the debate really came from two incompatible views of the nature of human life and the future of human life. So let me give you a couple, you know, four or five principles that I think we need to think about when we talk about all of these technologies, stem cell being just one of them. The first is there are multiple stakeholders here, and there are stakeholders that have a very strong voice in these debates and stakeholders that are almost never heard of. And one of the things I think that's really important is for us to debate what are the goals and aspirations of biotechnology. I mean, we take it for granted that we all want the same thing to cure disease and all of that, but when you actually get granular about it, when you talk to people about what their values are, you find lots of differences that come out of that. You know, Everybody wants to, you know, some vision of the good, some vision of human flourishing, uh, progress. But people mean very different things by those terms. And by not exploring them in a really deep way, we end up just assuming that people are going after the same kinds of goals, when very often they're not. Um, and that includes, by the way, the cure of disease itself. I'm very involved in the disability studies group at Emory. And they have a very different view of what we even mean by curing of disease and whether curing of disease in the way in which many people think about it is even itself a good thing. So for example, there have been some writings coming out of disability studies that look at the microcephaly that the Zika virus is causing as an argument saying, you know, we've sort of taken it for granted that it's a horrible thing and that everyone with microcephaly is, you know, somehow a, a diminished human being. And is that really the way in which we should think about these people? So the first point is we need to hear voices we don't often hear and we need to consider perspectives that we don't often consider. I think the fear that we have is if we hear those voices, they're going to wipe out our view of what progress might be. But the point of conversation is not to adopt the other person's point of view, but to hear it. Right? And I think we shouldn't be threatened 
by other people's point of view, and I wish our uh, political candidates believed that also. Um, the second <coughs> issue is risk, and uh, Dr. Pence talked about risk, but I want to talk about, and he talked about the precautionary principle. So there are two ways to approach any new technology. The precautionary principle, prove to me it's not going to harm, and what we call the probable harm principle, um, you know, uh, let's assume that this is okay unless someone can demonstrate it might harm. And we here tend to take more of a probable harm principle, though I think, as, as Dr. Penn said, there are certain discrete areas where we take more of a precautionary principle. Europe takes more of a precautionary principle. We have to land somewhere in between. Um, there are plenty of examples of biotechnologies that got out and caused immense harm, alien species and things like that that are now kudzu, you know, that's not taking over. If you go every day as I drive into Emory, um, there are signs out in the low water that they're removing uh, Chinese privet from uh, the entire place. That was an alien species that was uh, uh, introduced. So we have to be careful there. But here's the point I want to make about risk that people don't often think about. And I, I have a whole talk just about this one point in relation to precision medicine, but it's true all around. All around. One would think that evolution would give us a really good sense of risk. After all, if you're an organism, what could be more important to you than being able to assess risk? But we're really, really, and I mean really bad at it. And I think that that is actually a brain structure issue. I don't think it's that if only we could get more skilled at it. We simply don't have the capacity to do it. And what I mean by that is this. Let's say we all took genetic tests and you were 20% above average at risk for colon cancer. You were 40%. I was 60%. You were 80%. Are those meaning, does that mean anything to anybody really? Should the 40% and the 80% behave differently? What about 40% versus 6%? And what does that even mean, that I am 60% more likely to get colon cancer? I don't know what it means. I study statistics. I'm a sociologist. Statisticians don't know what it means when you ask them to translate that into any pragmatic or practical way of thinking about it. They cannot do it. And when they try to do it, they're wrong. And I can show you studies that show we don't have the capacity to understand risk in a really profound way. We basically understand risk as high or low. And even then, we're not sure what to do about things, right? Should a woman at much higher risk for breast cancer behave differently than a woman at normal risk? Well, unless she's going to get a prophylactic double mastectomy, and that's a, certainly a tragic but reasonable decision some women make then the answer is no. She should do regular mammography like any woman should do regular mammography in soft breast exams, right? So we don't even know how to calculate this idea of risk, and yet we, we are getting more and more. Medicine is becoming a risk management system. And pretty soon you're going to go to your doctor, have your whole, whole genome in the computer, and they'll start giving you all these risk statistics. And they won't mean anything, I contend. Um, so. Uh, Third thing, and that is this move to sort of a transhumanist view of the nature of biotechnology, right? And this is where you have an incredible split in the way in which people think about these technologies. Um, on the one hand, you have people who are extremely cautious, you know, and, and uh, Dr. Pence mentioned uh, Leon Cass. He's he was uh, very instrumental in, in sort of championing this perspective, and Francis Fukuyama, who was on the uh, uh, Bush Bioethics Commission with Dr. Kass has written a book in which he basically argued that this move to genetic man manipulations of humans is the most serious threat to humanity in the 21st century. That far, right? And in one sense, he's right. I'm not sure about the word threat. But it is one of the things that most promises, threatens, depending on your perspective, to change the fundamental nature of human life. For the good or for the bad, right? And so the transhumanists say for the good. The anti-transhumanist, if that's a word, say for the bad. But this is a fundamental value conflict that I'm not sure. You know, we always think if you can talk things out, work things out, you can come to a compromise. But when you have a fundamental value conflict, I'm not sure if you can. And this is one of those places where we're going to have to have a really serious uh, conversation. On one side, there's a kind of technological utopianism that sees uh, technology solving all the problems of humanity. And on the other side, there's kind of a technophilia that sees technology running away with that or that which is most human about us. Number four is protectionism versus transparency. And here you see 
you know, how much of these technologies should be released to the public. We had sort of the seminal moment of that with the 1918 flu viral genome, where after digging up some bodies from the permafrost, we discovered in them the 1918 Spanish flu virus, which killed 50 million people. It was the worst flu epidemic in modern history. And they decoded the genome and then had a big debate about whether it should be published or not. The, non, the people who said no said, people can get that, try to recreate the virus and cause an epidemic. People who said yes said, get it out there, let thousands of top scientists work on trying to find a cure or a way to stop it. And it's a much more powerful way to protect us than to try to protect this thing which may get out and then what? Then we won't have any countermeasure. So that's a fundamental question. And then finally, the last thing um, is the thing I am actually most concerned about of all of this. And again, it's not so much about stem cells but about biotechnology generally, and that is the do-it-yourself movement. Right now, the average middle school biology class can do things that the best scientists in the world couldn't do 20 years ago. That's how fast the technology is moving. With CRISPR, this new technology for um, uh, genetic manipulation of organisms uh, is, is, is already, but pretty soon, will become even so simple that you will be able to alter organisms, again, in a middle school classroom probably five to ten years down the line, in ways that would have taken years, or at least many, many, many months, just a few years ago and were impossible a few years before that. People are in their basements, so to speak, working on these technologies. One of my areas of expertise, which is kind of off what we're talking about today, is neuroscience. And some of the things being done with these disaggregated neural cells and some of the things people are doing to their own brains are really quite frightening. And how do you regulate that? How do you control do-it-yourself biotechnological intervention? How do you control do-it-yourself genetic manipulation of organisms? I don't know. So those are some, that, that to me is kind of the social context in which we're discussing stem cells. It's part of the reason, amongst others, that, that Dr. Penn said that there's this sort of tension between our cautionary uh, impulse and our desire to cure. And you know, I think as a society, we're just going to have to keep talking about this and try to work it out. time to uh, have some conversation and questions, so uh, go for it. Shall we? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Dr. If you'd like. The crowd is small enough that we can probably hear you. Um, my question is for both Dr. Pence and Dr. Wolf. Um, you guys mentioned that these are stem cells. My interest in this came like from, I guess, like early high school when I found out uh, they were beginning prenatal genetic diagnosing through the use of stem cells. So where do you guys stand on that and using stem cells? And in going forward, I guess, like, in people wanting to stem away from, I guess, diagnosing and more so creating their own, like, humans? So, I'll start. Um, so pre-implantation genetic selection um, is a form of eugenics. And we shouldn't shy away from that, though we often do. Um, the word is a scary word for us because of the history of eugenics. But we are making decisions on which embryos to implant based on their genetic characteristics. That's what eugenics is. Um, and here, and there's a lot to say that we could have done this whole thing just on that issue. But I will just say two quick things about it. We, first is we need to own that. That is, we need, you know, everybody's talking about in the, what happens in the future when we can make human beings and genetically, we're already doing it. And so we need to discuss it in a very kind of honest and open way. We're engaged in a massive eugenic enterprise, and that might be okay. It really might be okay, but let's talk about it rather than pretend we're not. And here's the second thing, and I just throw this out for you to think about. Imagine for a minute that my wife and I carried some terrible disease, and so we went and we got um, tested, and uh, we decided to use IVF, and we end up with six embryos. Two of the embryos carried the disease, Two of the embryos have the disease, two of the embryos are neither carriers nor have it. Which, what do we choose to implant? Of course, we implant the ones that neither carry nor have it. But why? I get why we don't implant the two that have it. Obviously, it's a bad enough disease that 
we need to get tested for it. But what about the two carriers? Why don't we implant that? Because it doesn't make sense. But why not? We know one piece of information about these embryos. For all we know, the two that don't carry it have genes for Alzheimer's and breast cancer and other things, while the two carriers, who are like me and my wife, or my partner, by the way, we're carriers, might be much healthier than the two that don't have either. And yet, we're making these decisions on a single data, right? We have tens of thousands of genes that we're not considering. We're considering one gene mutation and decide. And so, not only do we need to talk about this in a frank way, we need to execute this in a really educated way. And we're not doing that either. So um, that's at least one kind of set of comments on okay. I'm a philosopher, so I have to make a distinction. <laughs> um, I, I distinguish between eugenics with a big E and eugenics with a little E. Eugenics with a big E is what the Nazis did and what was going on a little bit in America uh, around 1924, where other people were trying to force you to either conceive or not conceive or actually destroy a child. Eugenics of the is eugenics, but what I call stealth eugenics, where individual couples are making the decisions. And they are making it for reasons that maybe aren't out in the open. Um, but it, it's a different kind of phenomenon. I, one um, report I read was that 90% of couples who discover their the fetus carries Down syndrome um, choose not to continue the pregnancy of the child. Um, and that's controversial. Uh, but I also want to go back to a comment about the greater good and the disagreements. Another version of that, I was recently involved in a conversation about cochlear implants for, <coughs> for deaf people. Uh, most people would assume that human flourishing in a good life involves the ability to hear. But there are some people who argue very passionately that there's nothing wrong with being deaf, and that if I could implant a deaf embryo, that's the one I'm going to implant. Because I want to, I want my child to experience deaf culture, and be part of my community. But there's a very big difference in theories of the good about that, right? Which I'm not sure we're going to reach consensus on. It's not too dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> um, my second question is, you said that they won't a vote for Dr. Pence. Um, they're not really allowing clinical trials, even though we've made progress in most of these areas. Um, do you think that it's possible that they're doing this because they're, they don't really want to provide a cure? Not so much because they don't want to continue the studies or they're too scared to? Well, it's not they don't want to provide a cure. That's too dark. Um, some, I mean, I think the um, Hannah Red has this phrase, the banality of evil. It's just that it's the people don't, maybe don't care enough to go forward. Um, there is a, but I, I do think there are people who would volunteer. Um, and actually, to go get off another uh, point, this book is made. There's a long tradition in medicine of auto experimentation. Uh, the first cardiac catheterization by Bernard Forsman, he did it on himself. Um, and I, I think there are some educated, brave people who say of cystic fibrosis, maybe, you know, seeing their maybe their daughter suffocate, uh, which is a bad is a bad disease to die from, who, who might go on to go, you know, go forward. Uh, just Robert Altman, who used to be the reporter, the Excellent. medical reporter for the New York Times, wrote a book on self-experimentation. If anybody is interested, the history, the history is a good, very good book. Very good book. Yeah. Um, but let me just say something about that. You know, we, we tend to see conspiracy theories everywhere, but every once in a while they're there, um, and that's what that's what makes it difficult. I don't think that that's what's happening here, and the reason I don't think that that's what's happening here, it would, I would believe it if that were the only case of this. Or, but, it, but it's all over the system. The system is very scared right now, and they're, they're erring on the side of caution everywhere. And so, um, in that sense, so I, I was telling uh, uh, 
uh, Dr. Pence beforehand, we just put in a uh, grant to NIH to study. Um, the goal of the grant is to try to help rewrite or at least reinterpret the regulations that exist now um, that try to protect prisoners from research because of a whole history of really bad abuse of prisoners and research. But what has happened instead is it's become so difficult to do research on prisoners. And HIV amongst, especially African American prisoners, but <coughs> in general, is much higher than the, any other place in the public. And you can't go in and do research on it because of well-meaning legislation to try to protect prisoners from past abuses. So the question of how you balance those things is always, always problematic. And for those of you who are interested in bioethics, uh, there's a nice master's program right here in town. Uh, the pedigree, every issue of bioethics has a pedigree. It's really important to uh, learn it. So the prison experimentation has a long history. There were some abuses in Alabama and Baltimore prison. And, and things have kind of gone back and full force, you know. And, uh, and actually, prison's a very boring. It gives new meaning to the word boring. Uh, and, and most prisoners really would like to do something in the research. Uh, the other thing is, in bioethics, I think not only does every issue have a pedigree, but always need to follow the money trail. Who's making money? Uh, one of the things that's going on with CRISPR right now is there's two big groups battling over patents. Uh, and that's, you know, getting the, getting the money is going to be real. It helps up the, you know, Montagne and Gallo fought over who drugs for, you know, antibody tests for HIV and tells to dumb things up. So that's another thing that's holding things up is the desire of people to make money on the stem cell therapy. Sam? Uh, when people start using CRISPR to eliminate heritable diseases, how are we going to maintain genetic diversity and how are we going to choose which diseases we permit to be eliminated? Uh, considering that we don't understand how any given gene works so I'll take half of it. Okay, you take half of it. I don't think the genetic diversity is wrong. And we'll leave out the third half. <laughs> the, the human gene pool is so huge. There's about 7 billion people right now trying to recreate themselves and having sex. Uh, even if you could use CRISPR and create a couple million like people that were super intelligent or seven feet tall, they would be drowned out in the, in the, in the huge tide of humanity mm -hmm. moving forward. So you get what in population genetics is called regression to the mean. You always get regression to the mean. It, it would be, it's actually hard to improve the human race genetically because of this. So I don't think that particular worry is going to be a big one, but the other ones, yes. So here's an, another one, and let me say something. It would only become a worry in that sense if the whole globe, you know, if, if Gattaca happened. That is, if almost every child, if you saw the movie, for those of you who didn't go rent it, um, great bioethics movie, uh, if, if um, everybody was born through some sort of genetic movie. If you went down to Genes R Us and you picked out the palette for your kid, right, you know, I want the uh, Michael Jordan athletic palette and the Kanye West musical palette, not, please don't get his personality, just <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and so on, and you, you know, if, if that ever came, and believe me, we will be dead in our children and maybe our grandchildren before that ever happened. That's the only way. But here is where there might be some concern, and that is we don't really understand the protective nature well of disease genes. So we know, for example, that sickle cell developed because people who are heterogeneous for sickle cell, that is, they had a sickle cell gene and a non-sickle cell gene, so they didn't have the disease, were more resistant to malaria. And that's why it developed. And there are many diseases like that where they developed in a particular ecological niche for a protective reason. We don't know why flu goes through a uh, population and I get it and Greg doesn't get it. We don't know. Maybe there's some disease and maybe a disease gene that he has that protects him from it. So if we start eliminating disease genes, my concern more than homogenizing the species is I'm wondering what we're getting rid of that unbeknownst to us might protect us against the next Zika epidemic or something like that. We just don't know. Yeah, I have a question about um, clone cells. 
there must be a lot of research on clone cells within non-human animals. So yes. there is progress. For, no, yeah, non-human animals. So how bad is it that at the moment we're not supposed to do anything with you know, human stem cells if there's a lot of development in, in animal models? But, you know, we, we have a lot of experience that just because something works, even in primates, it doesn't necessarily work in humans. True. So, uh, the key step is the phase one trials in humans. Uh, and, you know, that's what we haven't really done. No, I mean, you can cure almost anything in mice. If you want to be healthy for the rest of your life, be a mouse. <laughs> uh, be a mouse in a lab, except for some. But, but, but until we do the translational work, until we do the translational work, it means almost nothing. So we can cure the mice. Um, and if, and you know, if we're too scared to actually start human trials, then the mouse models ultimately don't mean much. I mean, just take, take stroke. I mean, I think we tend to New England Journal of Medicine has a nice article on stroke this week. How everybody should get TPA in an hour. Uh, and for a long time, nobody took stroke seriously. It was just like something that happened, we can't do anything about it, too bad. Uh, and it was only recently we saw it as a thing that emergency medicine should prevent. Uh, so we, we kind of came around the right way. So what I'm trying to say is I think there's a lot of people who are suffering from degenerative diseases. We're not really taking their suffering seriously enough in our cost-benefit calculations. We're so afraid of maybe hurting somebody the first time that we're kind of leaving all these other people out there, which is, you know, if you know somebody, it's, it's, it's devastating. And, and by the way, just to take that back to kind of the 30,000 foot step that I like to do, part of that is a is a atmosphere that we have of suspicion about science and about things like pharmaceutical research. There are reasons why we have those suspicions. This isn't a pure history. But, we, but because of those suspicions, we tend to um, you know, assume all kinds of nefarious desires by pharmaceutical companies and research and all that. They're there sometimes. But, but how do you keep a good balance between the desired progress that we all want on diseases that harm all of us and our families um, and in a capitalist system where we have made the decision could uh, talk uh, about the money issue. The money issue is there, but part of the reason the money issue is there that it is because we've decided um, to go with a capitalist version of competition over cures. Okay. And to make, I think you make a philosophical point. I want to make a sociology. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. This is called interdisciplinarity. We're yes. all for it. I mean, <laughs> try to think of a movie where scientists are a good guy. There's so many movies where there's the evil scientist, the arrogant scientist. Oh, you got one, huh? Iron Man. What? Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> I am legend. <laughs> those are the only two I got. <laughs> <laughs> but for every one of those, there's like a hundred boys from Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> or X-Files, you know, it's like, there's so oh, there's many. There's a great study done where they ask people about some of these technologies that we think the public is scared of. And it turned out that the study showed that people aren't that, it isn't that people are scared of cloning and stem cells in CRISPR. People are scared of the scientists. They don't believe scientists have a moral compass. They don't believe scientists will use these technologies for the good of all. They still have sort of a Frankenstein in his lab version of what science is like. Jurassic Park. The Jurassic Park version, right? No, very, almost no science happens that way. Um, but that's still how we think about it, and uh, so it's. And the, I, I, I talk a lot to scientists. I train scientists in ethics, and I tell them this all the time. I say, you know, you need, you need better PR, and you need to be advocates of your own work because the way in which the public looks at scientists is very, you know, is, is highly distorted. I'm just. You know, I think we probably didn't. There was a teaching moment here. Emphasize how big an issue CRISPR is. It's right. going to, CRISPR is going to be, the, to me, the big issue of the next five years. Absolutely. And it goes right to how we view scientists, whether we're going to trust people with CRISPR, right? So if we don't basically trust most scientists, then we're not going to let them use CRISPR. We're going to prevent it. Right. 
I don't know. If, I don't know if we can prevent it. Well, that's that's the other thing. I mean, up till now, this level of scientific manipulation could only happen in the most advanced labs. And so, if we wanted to control it, we probably could have. We can't anymore. These technologies have become so much easier that they're going to be able to be done by people in simple labs, not just at the top ten places. So, the kind of thing we're talking about here is some graduate student of microbiology creating a frog that glows in the dark gold that says Georgia State University. You know, <laughs> as it goes down, I mean, that kind of thing. You know, like, it's really weird. You know? Hybridizing species and things like that. And you'll be able to perpetuate it. It'll be germ cells. I actually think that people who set up are where Freeside hacker space. Uh, and I had, I had an observation to share about biohackers. Uh, and I wanted to ask what you made, made of them. Like, so they kind of fall into two categories, in my understanding. One are like people who do science during their normal day and then like want to do science outside of it, or maybe are sort of frustrated because you know uh, the government shuts down and they can't do science anymore. Um, basically, like underfunded, under stimulated scientists who are going to do science one way or the other. And tech pros who think that they're like super smart and can like turn themselves into the bionic. Well, there are other categories too. So for example, there's the uh, genetic arts people and they want to, they don't care about any of that. They want to see if they can use the technologies to create artistic, aesthetic creations. And you know, they're not trying to improve humanity, but they can be just as dangerous. So here, here's the thing. With all the flaws, and Greg and I could talk for hours about the flaws and the ethical oversight systems that we have in science right now. Still, we have an ethical oversight system in science, right? So if people at Georgia State want to do science in the laboratories, they have to put it through the University of IRB or through the Animal Care and Use Committee, and there's an oversight, and probably the hierarchy of their department has something to say about it. When they want to submit it to a journal, the journal will have something to say about it. So they're all kind of fundable one. So there are all of these measures that at least try to keep some kind of ethical oversight over this technology. Your friends, there's none, zero, right? So as flawed as our system is in, in, in sort of formal science, at least someone is trying to keep an eye on the kinds of things they do. And, and believe me, a lot of science, more than you might expect, gets either stopped or significantly modified because of this oversight mechanism. When this moves into you know, basements and warehouses, that's gone completely. And that worries me a lot more than what's happening in the laboratories at Georgia State. There's an interesting uh, international sociological perspective, too. Uh, Stop talking about sociology. Oh, uh, I can't help <laughs> uh, well, One of my side jobs is coaching our bioethics program, too, the very big. And this year, there's, there's a, a case about Japan, Japanese took so. Uh, Japan has gotten Impatient with progress, and so they've given certain kinds of stem cell therapy uh, a seven-year exemption from the normal approval process. Uh, they have a lot of elderly people in Japan who are probably eager to have some kind of breakthrough. Um, and there's also, I think, a, a perception in the Pacific Rim that partly because of the Bush years, maybe because of American puritanical heritage, that we kind of got hung up on embryos, and this is an opportunity for the Pacific Rim to get ahead. Uh, you know, maybe not come again. So there are places like Malaysia, uh, Taiwan, pretty that have a lot of money in the stem cell research, and, and probably now CRISPR. Uh, so they, they see a one-time chance to leap ahead. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. China sociological point. Yeah, China, China, yeah, China, China's China. been on CRISPR. Been yeah. CRISPR and, and, and modified human embryos. Yeah. They went and planted or brought to it. So it's, it's not just done completely up to us. It's like international bioethics now. Sure. Uh, can you say your comment about the two, uh, like the two, two uh, IPF examples and in considering your comment, Dr. Pence, on 90% of couples terminating uh, yeah, yes. um, I'm wondering if you think this uh, attitude that any kind of disease is bad comes from the individual or from society or some like outside pressure because I read a study about how, because um, in the Netherlands they conducted 
um, they surveyed women who terminated um, their pregnancy, and one third of the women actually said their doctors didn't even mention hold, uh, carrying through the attack, like carrying through the uh, carrying the pregnancy at all in the options. And so, but then it wasn't really presented as a thing. And I guess I'm I'm trying to figure out whether it comes from us or from well, there, there are profound cultural differences in how we look at those things. And because our society has, as Dr. Penn said, this very strong issue about, a very strong cultural um, argument going on about pro-life versus pro-choice, we tend to be much more attentive as a culture to the question of carrying uh, pregnancies mm -hmm. in turn. In some other societies where that argument is not really a relevant cultural conversation, they're not as concerned about those kinds of questions. Um, you know, but even here, I have been involved in situations where women have complained that when they've gotten genetic diagnoses of, of some kind of prenatal condition, the assumption was that they were going to abort. Um, and in some cases, that's not what, what they would choose. So, uh, and one last thing about this, and this will get us off into something else, so I'll just say it and then leave it. You know, we assume that there's sort of a universal view of what disease is and what disease is and what disability is and what it isn't. And now we just have to talk about whether we want it or not. But in fact, there are also profound cultural differences about how we think, how we define disease, how we define disability, what kinds of things are in those categories and not in those categories, and how we should think about it both prenatally and postnatally. And so it actually isn't a simple conversation, e even before you get to the point of, of things like diagnosis and, and Management. And what's going to come, not only new order, I think we're all going to be talking about CRISPR for the next five years. We may be talking about Zika in pregnancy. And, you know, just to go to the same point, you know, the most of South America is down. And the assumption is you can't have an abortion. Even if you're, even if you have Zika and, and your baby's microcephalic. Uh, and the Pope was asked for an exemption, and he said no. Uh, but I, I think we're just seeing the beginnings of Zika. We're in Alabama and Georgia. We are gonna have those bad mosquitoes, right? And we are gonna have Zika. He uh, said no about abortion, but he left the door open for contraception, which itself was a, was a which is a big, big step, step, right? Yeah. Uh, he's a different kind of pope, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I like the guy. <laughs> To get the money, you got to get the patent, right? right? So you got to have to like inject some point. Like, I want to ask. I want to answer. That. I want to ask your question differently. Right. What are we willing to risk for innovation? Right. So Steve Jobs and Wozniak, they didn't risk anything except some of their time. Right. And they're very. <laughs> uh, but when you're talking about biohacking. You're talking about creating something that could cause environmental devastation if you create something that's toxic to the environment that can cause human devastation if it ends up being pathogenic, right? So we're not just talking about going and creating a new kind of phone or computer or even something brand new mechanically. We're talking about manipulating the very plasms of life and that, that has a different risk profile. And so, you know, part of, part of the thing that many people have critiqued is our sort of fetishization of progress and fetishization of innovation. And that's part of this technological utopianism that I spoke about. It has to be counterbalanced with other kinds of values. Now that doesn't mean you're a lot or you want to stop it. It means that all of, you, all of human life is about compromise and balance. And we all want innovation, we all want disease to be cured, we all want new things. But to make that the sole criteria of value is a recipe for some kind of a crisis or disaster or epidemic or environmental crisis. And so you just, you, know, you have to balance innovation against certain other values. And to take another 30,000 foot view, uh, I hope you can tell that, uh, I think 
bioethics is the most interesting field in academia today. Every time you think it's kind of like, you know, we're, we're, we're finished, a brand new issue comes along, Ebola, Zika. Uh, I remember Larry Altman wrote a column once. Yeah, I think I called him Robert Altman, the director, but it's Lawrence Altman was the, uh, I think so. If you wrote it down, it's Lawrence, not Robert. He directs movies, Lawrence writes them. <laughs> but he, he wrote a column, in, I guess it was shortly after the 80s, that there was a point where people thought they had cured all infectious diseases. Right. And then in 1981, HIV came along. Boy, were we wrong, you know? And we've had so much since the bird flu, SARS, uh, and now we know there's all kinds of things falling apart. But it's interesting, for bioethics, there's always a new issue, it seems like. Uh, and bioethics and neuroscience. Well, they are. I mean, it's all new issues. Um, it's really a fascinating field. Uh, and never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. And I, we, uh, we published the main journal in that area, the American Journal of Bioethics and Neuroscience. If you're interested in that, just a little plug for our journal. Mm -hmm. Cindy. So I have a question about risk for both gentlemen. Um, talking about the potential risks of if I understood correctly that we as human beings have limitations in terms of perceiving risk, how, what suggestions or ideas have you posited about how to bridge that gap um, in you know, bioethics? And do you think that it's plausible that we can bridge that gap if we have different conceptions of the good and the human version? So, I'm going to say something that academics and bioethics almost never say. I don't think you can solve that problem. I honestly don't. Because I don't think that human beings can conceptualize risk. So I think the way to, so I don't think you can ever find a way. So you, you know, we try to create metaphors and analogies, right? You have the same chance of doing this as you have of getting hit by light. Guess what? We don't have a clue what the risk is of getting hit by light, right? So even those analogies, um, don't don't really help. So the question is, so so the answer to me is, we need to get away from risk and risk languages, the way in which we talk about these things and communicate them, and try to think of some other framing of these issues. So for example, if someone says, look, you know, this gene says that there's a possibility of X in the future. We've studied thousands of people with that possibility. Here's what we think the best measures you should take, right? You haven't, you haven't defined it in terms of risk. You haven't asked the person to conceptualize and evaluate their own risk. You've, you, you've explained the situation and explained possible forms of action. But I, I just think that the risk language itself will never be able to be translated in a way that would be really helpful for people. Not everyone agrees with me, by the way. This is my perspective. But I, I really believe that's true. Judy, you didn't agree. I was just going to add a comment because in terms of, I, I guess, how you guys have explained the risk adverse at risk adverse risk attitude. I thought of uh, to make the example like smaller, like uh, say like when a partner and I will have problems and when I will like, try to articulate to them, he'll actually go to the very extremes, like, okay, I will never do X, whatever X is. Mm -hmm. But in doing when he says that, I'm seeing that he is very he's not listening to my uh, precise uh, issue with whatever right. happened. And I feel like that's a lot of the I mean, you're reading history, it's like, well, we did this and we're going to go to the complete extreme and not even really hearing what had happened and what went wrong, and so then it happens again. Um, insofar as, like, the, the uh, I guess it being a biological response that kind of threw me off, versus thinking of, of it as more like a, maybe a male societal thing, where they just don't have to really, I mean, boys don't really talk things out, that's just something they don't yeah. know. <laughs> they, but I don't think that has anything to do with risk community. I think that has to do with how we conceptualize life in general. I and mean, I think you're right about it. I think it is more a male trait than a female trait. But I will say this about it. You know, I, what, what he has, what, what a person in that situation has to understand is that the risk is less than 100%. But whether it's 80% or 60% or 40% or 20%, it doesn't matter. That's my point. We think in, I believe that we think in maybe three risk categories. Like high risk, low risk, and medium risk. Maybe. Right? At best. But we don't think in 25.3% of this. There's no meaning whatsoever. And not only that, if you ask the average person, what is, you know, if you say to them you have a X percent risk, 
the, the answer you often get is, or if you ask them to estimate risk, their answer is a very logical one. They say, wait a second, I'm either going to get it or I'm not going to get it. And they will either translate that as a 50-50 risk in all cases, or they will translate that as 100 or 0. If I get it, the risk was 100%. If I don't get it, the risk was 0 That's how the, you know, the vast majority of people think about statistics. And here's my point about that. If you try to teach them the right way to think about statistics, I'm not sure you've added a single important element to their thinking. I'm really not, because I, I don't think that we think well about risk, that we make decisions well about risk, and that we understand risk in, in that kind of a way. I just don't think that the human brain is designed for that. Uh, so what do each of you think the attractive, the appeal of this kind of risk of discourses? Is it that it seems, uh, it, it's somehow satisfying for us to be able to at least think we can kind of quantify what are really very difficult to conceive of um, potentials, or what what's the resistance to adopting a different uh, model other than that it's, it requires a huge shift in our thinking? We don't know how else to talk about it. I really believe we don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. Dr. Penton, this is my idea, this whole risk, and Dr. Pence hasn't weighed in on it yet, but um, I just, I really don't think we know how to discuss it other than risk. Not only that, there's a disconnect between our science and our human management, right? You know, if you study 10,000 people, you can quantify it in terms of risk, right? That's what the statistics do. They aggregate every, and that's part of the problem, right? It's an aggregate question, right? The reason I have a 60% risk of colon cancer is because a study of a million people found that 60% of them, so to speak, with this gene got colon cancer has nothing to do with me in one sense. Right? And that's why people say either I'm going to get it or I'm not. So the whole way in which we try to translate aggregate risk into individual risk jumps over a chasm that I don't think we can ever really figure out how to make it meaningful to an individual. And it, and it may be that, I, mean, I, I think I agree that I don't think we're ever going to agree on the, a theory of the good, but we'll agree on certain risk ratios. Uh, so we might have to just give up on content and go to the process. Uh, and it may be that we already tolerate some people in the armed forces taking extraordinary risks, Navy SEALs, uh, in, in combat situations. Uh, the other day in Birmingham, uh, a truck went off the road, burst in flames, and a woman firefighter off duty went into that truck and pulled somebody out. You know, and she's being watered as a hero, rightfully so. Um, but maybe we should have some medical heroes, people who volunteer to take extraordinary risk. And, you know, we might say, I, I wouldn't do that. But, I, you know, give them a chance. And give them like a med congressional medical, you know, medical <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, why not? I mean, some, some people are more risk takers, I think. Uh, we, we could be sure they're informed, you know, deep informed consent. But that, that's one possible avenue. Uh, sort of a, a, a very quick and straightforward question, and then a much less so, a quick, not straightforward. Um, uh, straightforward question, not a straightforward answer. Oh, God. Um, so <laughs> you said earlier that there were studies you could cite of uh, statisticians being unable to convey pragmatic descriptions of risk. Is that, do you have those at the top of the um, question? Do I have yes, I can get, I need, I, can't decide it for you, but I can look on my computer when we're done. Uh, can, we, uh, can, can you please um, elaborate on uh, what kind of infrastructure you would need and what kind of historical precedents there are for um, self-selecting medical risk takers and how to ensure you know, true consent? Uh, yes. I think we want to make sure that they don't come but the kind of thing I'm talking about is, you know, really radical, like the first thing we the sickle cells. They're not a, what we call a research ethics, a member of a vulnerable population. We don't want somebody, uh, you know, doing it for the money, like, you know, doing blood or in a, uh, probably not in a prison or in some kind of hotel for homeless people. So I, I would be more comfortable with someone who is very educated and an affluent uh, person who had a lot of resources to get the best informed consent. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a, there used to be a prize in medical ethics called the Nellie Western Prize. 
uh, I don't know if it still exists, mm -hmm. but it was for medical residents. And a guy in Hoffman showed that if you really, really want to, you can get uh, a person with an eighth grade education at the level of deep informed consent to someone with a PhD if you really, really want to. You can like, give them tests and quizzes. So I think it's possible to really inform some people and make sure they're not vulnerable. Uh, and then I would be able to take risks that other people would take. Can I raise two uh, follow-up questions? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, can we get a distinction between uh, being informed and being invulnerable? Because I, I do think those are two different things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and also, is is that not what Rick Perry and Howie, uh, Gordy Howe, and uh, other people of, of status are already doing? Are they, are they, do we not? We don't seem to have a lot of people who, uh, uh, like that, who uh, take risky and unproven treatments. Oh, maybe, I mean, I didn't mean to put down Gordy I mean, okay. what, what the problem is, it's, it's the same thing that happened uh, early days of HIV, I was in the was a chair of the board of Birmingham and outreach. There was an underground pharmacy in Mobile where kind of like Dallas Dollars, but where people were trying all kinds of stuff. But the problem is no one was keeping track of it. You know, it was just all anecdotal and, and nothing really good came out of it because you, you gotta have some control, some reporting, you know, to get something good. It's kind of like the uh, these health food stores, you know, you can treat yourself with all kinds of crap. There's no reporting requirement for all this stuff. You know, when you're, you go about Boa, could be killing people with the right, blowing out the livers. We would never know about this. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so we don't know if Gordy Howe was helped by it or not. And we'll never probably know. That's, yeah, that's, that's the problem. And stem cell, and then the other side of that is stem cell tourism. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are probably places that do it at a very high level of medical sophistication. And then there are, you know, the storefront stem cell, you know, places where you're probably probably not even getting stem cells, but in, in the, you know, so there's no quality control possible in a lot of those kinds of situations either. Uh, Aaron Levine at um, Georgia Tech has written about uh, uh, stem cell tourism if you're interested in that. Is there a general idea of the something we could never do before. It allows us to do things we could do with much more effort and over a much longer period of time, quickly and more simply. Which then, of course, allows us to do things we couldn't do before in the sense that when things are simpler, you can just do them you know, more productively. Uh, why, would we, why would we want uh, you know, people in middle school to experiment uh, you know, in, in the lab or with anything? Uh, because we think it's educational. And once CRISPR you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, these technologies that we now think of as cutting edge and, and you know, and, uh, whose place in our sort of scientific firm and are still questionable, will be established, normal, routine things that we do. And so why not, in some, I mean, some people will suggest, why not use them in controlled situations? And I'm not worried about what happens in the middle uh, school classroom around CRISPR because there'll be CRISPR sets that the teachers buy from some place that's very well controlled. Um, I'm concerned about the fifth grader gets really turned on by it and then opens up the warehouse. You know, what is it? Sixth grade at least opens up the warehouse, you know, and starts doing it on the side. That that's what concerns me. Something that's not an issue. Sounds like you're planting a seed, you know, for that one person too. But it's going to be. I mean, the same thing is true. I, look, when I was a kid, and I'm sure. When, we, they used to sell chemistry sets. And these chemistry sets had a little vial with about, vials with about 30 different chemicals in them, including mercury, <laughs> right? 
including mercury, and we loved you know, moving that mercury around our hands. I did it. You know, there were probably combinations there, I'm sure there were, that, that were explosive, that were toxic. But it was a different time when we didn't wear seatbelts and we didn't wear helmets and we didn't wear pads and somehow a few of us, enough of us survived to perpetuate the species. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it was a, so, you know, we, we tend to use the, the science of the day to try to train young people, or at least in some ways we should, and if it becomes routine, we'll do it in fifth grade also. And, you know, it's possible that, I agree with it, and Mickey will, that we got too hysterical about little things in the past, and now we would probably should get more hysterical. We're not, we may not be able to, you know, appreciate the danger. You know, in this day of, uh, Google and Wikipedia and transparency of knowledge, it's going to be very hard to contain this knowledge. Almost any knowledge. It's going to be very hard. The genie's out of the bottle. So, I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. Oh, that uncertain positive. <laughs> 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 Thanking Professor as well being said.